My name is Donna Vandeveld. I am Lakota, Métis, Chinese and Scottish. I was born and raised here in Saskatoon, but my parents and my grandparents came from southern Saskatchewan, more specifically Wood Mountain, Willow Bunch and Moose Jaw. And I'm Deborah Lee. I'm Nehio or Cree and Métis from Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation uh, near Amiskwachi, Waskaigan, or what is now known as Edmonton. I've been a librarian here at USASC in various roles for 15 years and I also work part-time uh, for a library consortium that uh, serves academic libraries in Western Canada. I am also a mother of two adult kids and a grandmother to boy and girl twins. We're here at the Murray Library in the Saskatoon campus of University of Saskatchewan, located on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We honour the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and the land itself, for without it we would not survive. We're here today to tell you about our exhibit that we created called Not Just Another Day Off, Orange Shirt Day and the Legacy of Indian Residential Schools. In July 2021, some of us who work here at the library, including the staff at the University Archives and Special Collections, discussed the idea of creating a display to honor the first ever National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th. We recognized that some people are unaware of the intention behind the Orange Shirt Initiative, which began in 2013. This past year, people have been wearing orange shirts throughout the year to honor and mourn the confirmed graves of children found at former residential school sites. We thought it was important to explain what the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP, is to people, because it is listed on 15 of the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. At a presentation that one of the three TRC commissioners gave here in Saskatoon, Chief Wilton Littlechild mentioned that he sees UNDRIP, the treaties, and the calls to action as the framework for reconciliation, weaved together like a braid. Canada was one of the four countries not to recognize UNDRIP when it was first established in 2007. There are three other countries that also voted against it. We are hoping that people will be intrigued to learn which ones are the other three countries, especially since this is a learning institution. In fact, the purpose of this exhibit is to inspire others to want to learn more. Throughout the exhibit, we place some cards with images of orange t-shirts with text of some thought-provoking questions and we invite visitors to watch for them. We collaborated with Jake Moore and the University Art Galleries to introduce the idea of tying orange ribbons around campus by people as their pledge to learn more. Each ribbon represents a child whose grave was confirmed this past year for a current total of 9,000. We are extremely grateful to the students of the Saskatchewan Urban Native Teacher Education Program, or SUNTEP, as well as Jake Moore and the staff at University Archives and Special Collections for cutting those ribbons. Those ribbons will be collected in September 2022 this allows new students to see the ribbons and introduces them to the idea that each month, University of Saskatchewan honors residential school students and their families. In this cabinet, we've got some orange shirt pins to accompany the poster above. We've also got some information about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, including some information about how Bill C-15 was passed on June 21, 2021, and a memorandum of understanding between the City of Saskatoon and the Saskatoon Tribal Council. We wanted to demonstrate that once a person learns what UNDRIP is, they will recognize it in the news and realize how important it is. This little booklet lists the articles of UNDRIP, and we chose to highlight it throughout the exhibit by using small cards with the image of that book cover to show how it is not being honored within those themes of the exhibit. Those cards have a specific article listed on them. We have enlarged a copy of the Royal Proclamation of 1763, the original treaty, and various books that we suggest. These little booklets are from the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. It has all 94 calls to action, and it also has the articles of UNDRIP in it as well. This book here is edited by Tasha Hubbard and Marilyn Patra. 
It's called The Land is Everything, Treaty Land Entitlement. There are several essays in this book, and some of them explain the spirit and intent of the treaties. We wanted to focus on land acknowledgements, including the one that we use here at the University of Saskatchewan. There is a standard one that people can use, but a lot of people don't realize that you can actually write your own. In fact, that's more meaningful rather than copying and pasting something that is suggested for you. If you're going to put a land acknowledgement on an email signature, it needs to come from the heart and you need to believe it. It is suggested that a land acknowledgement should acknowledge how you have benefited from living on these lands and territories. The Gwena Moss Centre for Teaching and Learning offers an online module where you can actually develop your own land acknowledgement. And there's a QR code here where you can go to find that link. I recommend going to the main USASC website, www.usask.ca, and search for land acknowledgement, and you can find it. We've included some examples of what others wrote. I'll read one for you. With gratitude to the land, air, water, and animals, I want to acknowledge in solidarity that we are on both Treaty 6 territory and on the homeland of my Métis ancestors of the past, present, and future. I invite you to reflect on your position as we journey together towards reconciliation. Liz Durrett, Diversity and Inclusion Consultant, Human Resources. Here we have an introduction to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. We'd like to emphasize that these should not be referred to as recommendations. Here's an example of some books and videos that you can borrow from the library to learn more. This is a QR code leading to an easy-to-use guide that is sorted by resources you can watch, read, listen, and learn, and also about reconciliation initiatives that you can participate in. You can find the link to that guide on the exhibit's website as well. Special thanks to Métis librarian Sheila LaRock for creating that guide. This is on the ground floor across from Starbucks. Our hope was that people who were studying here and grabbing a coffee would take the time to read some of the calls to action. Continuing on here on the first floor, the focus here was on the impacts of Indian residential schools and other racist colonial policies. The themes of the various display cabinets on this floor were developed by me, Deborah Lee. We are also very grateful for the professional assistance of the Archives and Special Collections employees. This cabinet here focuses on residential schools in general. For the most part, these are fairly recent books which tell the personal stories of IRS survivors, thrivers. Given that the Library and Archives and Special Collections Unit created an earlier IRS exhibit in 2012, for the TRC National Gathering here in Saskatoon, we wanted to include primarily publications which were published since 2012. This cabinet focuses on the various kinds of relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Some of the items in this cabinet tell of a conciliatory journey, but others tell of the colonial violence that continues to this day. This cabinet is focusing on children and youth, such as the children's book about the origins of the Orange Shirt Story by Phyllis Webstad, and autobiographies of residential school survivors written for children such as The Water Walker and Fatty Legs, a great story of Indigenous resilience and a great read for adults, too. We also included some references to Indigenous education at the post-secondary level, such as the Think Indigenous Education Conference program, which originated at USASC. This cabinet here on the right is about resistance and resilience from a youth perspective, primarily using film and video formats. We have a Red X talk here with local activist Erica Violet Lee, and another with activist Melina Labucan Massimo. Other items include a book created by youth in northern Saskatchewan about the suicide crisis and their determination to try to curb this crisis. We have a series of posters that were created by students in Dr. Winona Wheeler's Indigenous Studies Pictorial Histories class for the Truth and Reconciliation National Event that was held here in Saskatoon in 2012. This PowerPoint presentation includes all the items in the exhibit, and the PDF version is on our website. 
This cabinet has many archival documents pertaining to the education of Indigenous children and peoples. We give special thanks to the employees at the University Archives and Special Collections that pulled the many requested phone from the archives while I searched for rich and relevant content for the exhibit and for writing up the captions that tell us where the documents are from. Here is a document authored by Duncan Campbell Scott with instructions to Indian agents about Indian education in Canada from 1926. The instructions talk about protecting the interests of Indian children while at the same time respecting the rights of non-Indian Canadian citizens, the latter of which sounds like the priority. Here is an example of a green and white, an alumni magazine from the University of Saskatchewan about Indigenous people attending university in 1973. Also included is a 1995 registry of Indigenous faculty at universities across North America. Dr. Montour is one of the faculty listed. There's another note to all Indian agents regarding progress report cards from 1947. We have a couple of examples of blank report cards that were made. As you can see, it reads Departments of Mines and Resources, Indian Affairs Branch. We are unaware of any families actually receiving report cards while their children were at Indian residential schools. How would the parents have received them? These students were taken for months and sometimes years at a time, not to mention they are written in English, which is not the first language of parents and families. I don't believe that there was any communication going home. Some parents didn't even know that their child had died until much later. One item on this blue report card, which I found quite difficult to read, is in a section about desirable habits and attitudes. It says cheerful and optimistic. I find it hard to believe that anybody would be cheerful and optimistic in a residential school. Here's an example of another UNDRIP article, number 15. Indigenous peoples have the right to the dignity and diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories, and aspirations, which shall be appropriately reflected in education and public information. This 12-page booklet here is from 1909. It's the regulations relating to the education of Indian children. We've enlarged it and we printed the pages that are on display in a cabinet in the north part of the exhibit. This cabinet here is about child welfare issues. There are many issues related to child welfare as a result of residential schools. As the survivors grew up in institutions and so were lacking in parenting skills. The items in this cabinet can be quite alarming to many visitors. Examples of the green and white alumni magazine from the U of S had advertisements of how readers could adopt Indigenous children. In effect, the U of S was promoting the 60s scoop by including these ads in the green and white. This one is from fall 1970. The advertisement says, Give a child happiness. Have you the desire to give a child love and happiness? Why not consider a child of Indian heritage? There's a little Métis boy or girl waiting to fill your home with the magic only a child can create. Give a child a little love and you'll only receive a great deal in return. If there's room in your heart, you can become part of AIM, A-I-M. AIM is the acronym for the Adopt Indian Métis program, which had offices in Saskatoon and Regina. What struck me when I first saw that acronym is that it's the same acronym as the American Indian Movement in the United States. That was a grassroots resistance movement addressing poverty, discrimination, and police brutality against Native Americans, so having the same acronym is insulting. This one here is from winter 1970. Vicki, Brian, and Velma. It mentions these odd bios. Six-year-old Vicki likes school. Her quickness responsible attitude and general enjoyment of the classroom setting suggests she may be a natural student. Vicky's occasional moodiness cannot long hold out against her generally buoyant spirits. It was quite shocking to read these advertisements in our alumni magazine. Vicky, Brian, and Paul are now in their 50s. 
I wonder if they saw these pictures now, if they would recognize themselves. I wonder if they even have the same names. Here's the last advertisement. Here's something you can't buy. Who can put a price on happiness? There are wards of Indian heritage who have no hope of knowing the joy and happiness that comes with being part of a family. Give a child a little love and you'll receive a great deal in return. You can do it by adopting one of these forgotten children and becoming part of AIM. I was thinking about the Indigenous graduates who must have received these in the mail. Uh, from what I've learned, people who went to school here at that time, there was no way to self-declare and they could count on, on two hands how many other Indigenous students were here at the time. So I, I think about how hard it was for them to do that work, to get that degree and to get these alumni magazines in the mail to see this. This document is a proposal about preventing child apprehensions and strengthening Indigenous families. I included one of the thought-provoking questions on a card in this cabinet. It reads, It's been 30-plus years since this report was written, and we're still talking about this. Why are governments still willing to put more money into paying non-Indigenous foster families to care for Indigenous children than to invest in Indigenous families who require support to raise their children? This table here has some information about the Orange Ribbons and the Red Dress Project. The Red Dress Project was created by Métis artist Jamie Black in 2010 to create awareness of more than 1,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women across Canada. We purposely asked visitors to our exhibit if they knew what day it was held to intrigue them to seek out the answer if they didn't know. These are more posters that were created by Dr. Winona Wheeler's Indigenous Studies class back in 2012 for the Truth and Reconciliation National Event held here in Saskatoon. We have Cowessis First Nation as well as Labrette Industrial School, and in the middle between them we have a display that has a number of seminal journal and magazine articles that we highly recommend. These articles talk about the leadership and resilience of Indigenous peoples as well as the malnutrition that Indigenous peoples suffered in residential schools. We have links to these articles on the online exhibit resource guide in the To Read section. There is a column on the left that highlights these articles. This image may be familiar. You may have seen it before. It's called The Scream by Kent Monkman. It's actually on the inside cover of this book, The Inconvenient Indian, by Thomas King. What is shown here is actually a photocopy. It depicts the taking of Indigenous children from their homes by the RCMP to go to residential schools, and it looks quite real. Also in this cabinet are photocopies of the pages of a book from 1909 that was shown in the exhibit before about the official regulations relating to the education of Indian children. We enlarged one paragraph on one of the pages and highlight it above here. If any child in a boarding school should leave the school, to paraphrase, it basically says that the Indian agent or justice of the peace can go and take that child and bring it back to the school in which it had previously been placed. Even in the regulations book, Indigenous children were referred to as it. This cabinet is talking about how long we've been talking about reconciliation and how we haven't really gotten that far. This conference poster is from 2002 and comes from Dr. Trish Muncher's collection, as she was heavily involved in the organization of that conference. Also, we have included this guidebook from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission National Event in Edmonton in 2014. This poster is for the Labrette Industrial Residential School. This one hits close to home for me. One of my good friends, who was younger than I am, attended the school, as well as members of my family. When I showed this exhibit to my friend, she showed me the window of the room where she would have slept. On this poster, there's a photo of an example of some of the students that went to the school, and three of the names on this list are family members of mine from Wood Mountain, Saskatchewan. 
There's also a photo of girls working in the kitchen. My grandmother worked in the kitchen at this school. Her younger cousin Valerie died at the age of seven while attending there around the same time period. I'd like to acknowledge my friend Claire Thompson, who is from Wood Mountain, because she created this poster when she was in Dr. Wheeler's class. Many people think that these posters are talking about over 100 years ago because the images are black and white, but they're not. According to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, this particular school closed in 1998. Here we have a display about racialized policing in Saskatchewan in February 2000. These newspaper clippings come from the Trish Montour phone, clippings that she collected at the time, and I think about how it must have caused her concern at a time when she had visibly Indigenous sons living in Saskatoon. The situation of the deliberate freezing and other deaths of Indigenous people by local police is well known, and we cannot forget the impact this has had on our city and our community. Please note the Tasha Hubbard DVD cover and the Starlight Tour book by Reber and Renault in another cabinet in the exhibit about the more general topic of missing and murdered Indigenous peoples. This cabinet here focuses on Indigenous resistance and resilience. You will notice that UNDRIP Article 12 figures prominently here, such that Indigenous peoples have the right to manifest, practice, develop, and teach their spiritual, religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies, the right to maintain, protect, and have access and in privacy to their religious cultural sites the right to use and control their ceremonial objects, and the right to repatriation of their human remains. One of the questions that we pose here in this cabinet on the card with the little orange t-shirt reads, the next time you see Indigenous resistance on the news, will you look at it through a new lens? This cabinet is related to the justice system and the over-incarceration of Indigenous peoples, which in many cases stems back to growing up in the institution of residential schools, but also to the systemic racism in the quote-unquote justice system. For instance, many residential school survivors were not prepared to contribute to society when they left the schools and could not obtain gainful employment thereby ending up in prisons. Many Indigenous inmates felt that the prison environment was familiar, as it was similar to being institutionalized in the residential schools. Notice the fact sheet called Warehousing Indians, related to the situation of over-incarceration in Ontario in 1981-82. This document comes from the Trish Montour phone. The late Dr. Montour was a well-loved professor here at the University of Saskatchewan, and we have a Centre for Student Success in the College of Arts and Science named after her. For more information on Trish Montour and other faculty phone, such as Dr. Cecil King and Dr. Harold Woodsworth, whose phone also contributed to this exhibit, check out the website for this exhibit. In this cabinet, the key theme is missing and murdered Indigenous women and men. I touched briefly on that earlier about the Red Dress Project. You'll notice a couple of Red Dress beaded items in this cabinet. The secondary theme of this cabinet is the lack of policing to investigate these cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women. There's a graphic novel here about Helen Betty Osborne. 2021 was the 50th anniversary of her disappearance and murder in northern Manitoba. We also have a DVD here of Finding Dawn, which is about the Highway of Tears in British Columbia between Prince George and Prince Rupert, where many Indigenous women have gone missing. You can also see here the Starlight Tour book and Tasha Hubbard's Two Worlds Colliding DVD, referenced earlier as related to the problem of racialized policing, which has been occurring for decades, not only in Saskatoon, but across all prairie cities. We also wanted to tie together the connection between resource extraction and missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. 
For example, the man camps that are associated with resource extraction are also sites where many Indigenous women have gone missing. Our last cabinet here has a key theme of Indigenous health in and resulting from residential schools. You may have heard about Dr. Peter Bryce. He was hired in 1907 by the federal government to write a report about Indian industrial schools and children. He claimed that children were being systematically and deliberately killed, sometimes through starvation, by providing a mortality rate that was between 35 and 60 percent. In the report, he estimated that based on evidence, the government spent 34 times more on preventing tuberculosis amongst white children compared to Indian students in residential schools. The report was buried and he was later fired. They knew back in 1907 that there was malnutrition in these schools and that nothing was done. This information comes from a booklet called The Fallen Feather, Indian Industrial Residential Schools in the Canadian Confederation by Randy Bazo, published in 2007. Further, we have a DVD called Finding Peter Bryce that you could borrow to learn more. Many health researchers also attribute the malnutrition suffered by Indian children in the schools to the high rates of diabetes that Indigenous peoples continue to suffer. See Ian Mosby's article on Nutritional Experiments Done in Residential Schools and Indigenous Communities in the cabinet with the other seminal articles in it mentioned earlier. Also in this case is the theme of racism in the healthcare system. This book here, Structures of Indifference, talks about Brian Sinclair, who died while waiting in an ER waiting room in Winnipeg because nobody checked on him. He was dead for several hours before people even noticed. It really highlights how sometimes Indigenous people can seem invisible, especially when they are needing help. The Past System is another DVD that we highly recommend because it impacted on First Nations' rights to leave reserves, to provide for their families, and thereby limited their health outcomes. It was filmed here in Saskatchewan. Hi, hi. Thank you for taking in the video of this exhibit. We really appreciate the time that you take to learn more uh, about the topics covered in this video. I just want to say, Kinanas Komatinoel. Thank you, everyone. We'd also like to thank the staff at Archives and Special Collections here at the University of Saskatchewan and the Murray Library. They were a tremendous help on this exhibit. Over the past several months, I've had the opportunity to tour this exhibit with various people, instructors, students, uh, the provost, vice provost, indigenous engagement, and I noticed that sometimes people ask me at the end of the, the tour, they say, what would you like us to do? If you could have one wish, what would you like us to do? And I always say, I would like you to continue your learning journey, share it with others, and speak up when you hear uh, racist remarks. Uh, that's one of the the, the impacts of a, a lot of the items in this exhibit are, are stem from racism. So thank you for coming and thank you for your time and please keep learning. <laughs>